Hey, Katie, let's start with you. We have waited weeks for this decision. Many lawyers were getting more and more anxious, thinking this was not going to, wait to go the way they thought it should. What stands out to you? One of the first things that stands out to me is that this is a, an opinion that all three judges on the panel have signed on to. They are not showing any, there is no daylight between them. They all agree on every single one of these points. It makes it really strong in terms of whether or not this is something that should be appealed to the Supreme Court and whether or not the Supreme Court will take it. They've also put in a timing mechanism for Donald Trump. He can't continue to draw this out. They're saying you either need to appeal to the Supreme Court in the next few days or you need to say you want to bring this to the entire appeals court here in Washington, D.C. If you take the latter option, that's fine. But the trial can start in February. So they're really putting a shot clock on this and saying no more foot dragging. But again, this is a strong opinion. They agree on every point. They knock out every single one of his arguments in lockstep. And it's the kind of thing that feels airtight. So if you're the Supreme Court, you could look at this opinion and say, you know, I don't think there's much more for us to do here. There's not a big question to be answered that hasn't been answered fully by this panel. George, airtight. That's exactly what you wrote about today. Elaborate for us. Yeah, it's airtight. It, it went through every single one of Donald Trump's contentions, even the weakest ones, and methodically and systematically dismantled them one by one. There really isn't anything left of his arguments. And I don't, he can't really come up with any new ones. He threw up some arguments that he probably shouldn't have made. And, and that's the point for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, isn't going to have much to add to this. This opinion, it's hard to see any court any group of judges, even the Supreme Court, writing a better opinion than this. Then do you think it's going to make it tougher for Donald Trump to use his favorite defense, which is delay? Yeah, I, I do, especially because, as Katie mentioned, the D.C. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals built in uh, at least one roadblock to Donald Trump continuing to be able to exploit uh, the delay. And, you know, and I love that the um, the court used the very language of the Constitution to shoot down Donald Trump's ridiculous claim of absolute immunity. You know, they pointed to um, the president's responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And I think we can all ask ourselves, you know, uh, under what understanding of the English language can a president who has the duty to faithfully execute the laws of the country be empowered to violate the laws of the country with impunity and immunity. So now we're not out of the woods yet because there's one last justice hurdle to overcome, and that is, will the Supreme Court accept a review of the case? And that's exactly where I want to go next, Katie. Let's go back into those woods. Trump has until Monday to go to the Supreme Court. Walk us through that timeline. You know, that's really not very much time. And basically, you have to make the argument that what this appeals court has looked at and the arguments that they've made are somehow deficient. Now, as George pointed out, this is a really airtight case. And I think that one of the things, you know, we've been thinking about why is it taking this court so long this panel, excuse me, to come out with their ruling on immunity. I think one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to address serious questions that could leave this open to Supreme Court review. And one of them was whether or not there was venue at all, whether or not this court should be weighing in on acts. And there were some technical things in the, in the, uh, uh, ruling that I don't want to get too in the weeds on, but one was simply whether or not courts should be reviewing presidential acts at all. And then another was whether or not it was pr appropriate for the court to weigh in on a question basically before the trial had ended and a jury had come up with an opinion, like which is when when decisions are usually appealed, whether it was okay to do that in process. And one of the reasons they take both of those things so seriously is those are questions that the Supreme Court might want to weigh in on. And particularly in the case of whether or not courts can even review presidential decisions at all. They make a really important distinction. I'm sorry, I don't want to go on too long. They make an important distinction, though. One is that there are two types of presidential acts. The first is policy matters. Of course, courts don't really weigh in on this, kind of putting to bed this fear that Donald Trump brings up that if you can you can uh, accuse a president of a crime, presidents won't be able to make policy decisions. The second, though, which is called a ministerial decision, a ministerial decision is basically, are you doing the part of the job that says you're upholding the law? That is not up for debate. It's something that really speaks to separation of powers. If you're not upholding the law and the courts can't tell you you need to, 
why even have lawmakers? Why even have Congress if the president can throw out the laws? And that's what this case deals with. So they've really gone into his arguments. It would be, it's going to be difficult, I think, for Donald Trump's lawyers to show how the Supreme Court still has something to grasp onto here. George, I see you nodding. You agree? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And there are a couple more aspects of the opinion that are worth noting. One is that makes it more bulletproof against Supreme Court review is that they narrowly frame the decision. They narrowly frame the circumstances, the balance uh, that we, they use to determine whether or not there should be immunity in terms of the actual case involved here that it involved not a current president, but a former president, and equally important, that it involved a former president's effort while president to maintain himself in office contrary to the Constitution. And the, basically, when they, when they put together that balance, they basically said, well, there, if, if, you, if you allow this to happen, then there's no check on a president, and that a president can basically arrogate to himself the right to, to stay in office forever. And that can't possibly, that can't possibly be something that the court could support. George, Donald Trump was fundraising off of this less than three hours after it came out. You know Republicans, you know Republican donors very well. Are they going to keep donating for legal fees? Right? Like, I'm thinking, if I was a donor of a politician, I'd like to think that my dollars are going to bumper stickers and signs and rallies. Are Republican donors going to keep giving him money that's going to be handed to lawyers? I, I mean, that's hard, to, that's hard to know. I mean, they have in the past, and, and you see some of these solicitations. I happen to still get some of them. It's amazing how 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 what how stupidly they view. I mean, how stupid they think their donors and and voters are. But alas, that's that's what we have here. And I, I you know, I think that the large donors are, are 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 giving up. I mean, that's why you see the RNC running so short on cash. But Donald Trump seems to be able to suck up all of the small donors, and that's not good, frankly, for Republicans elsewhere on the ballot. Katie, is it fair to call this a win for Jack Smith, even though the case has been delayed and, and time is a huge problem here? You know, I think that anything that pushes this case closer to the day they can start doing jury selection is probably a, a win for Jack Smith. Also, interestingly, it's another instance in which Donald Trump's own words are being used to show why he is wrong. So Jack Smith does that in many, many of his filings. He cites uh, Donald Trump's own language, own words, and own assertions to show why later he then did something he should know is wrong. And even here, the appeals panel finds an instance of that where they say, you know, in his own impeachment hearing, Donald Trump's own lawyers say, if you're looking at his actions around January 6th, and if you want to decide whether or not what he did around January 6th is correct, impeachment is not the right venue. The courtroom is the right venue. They even say that then during his impeachment hearing. So here he is, here he is again. So yeah, I, I think this is probably a win for Jack Smith. Glenn, some say that this ruling is a sign that our justice system will not allow Donald Trump to pursue a more authoritarian vision without checks and balances if he wins in November. Are you as hopeful? Um, I'm guardedly optimistic. I think it's a sign that the rule of law is being prodded into wakefulness and applied to Donald Trump as it should have been all along. Um, and I hope, Steph, that the Supreme Court decides not to accept this case for review, because I feel like it's a near certainty that they will agree with the, the ruling from the three-judge panel. And they really don't need to accept this case for review to simply render an opinion that says, we agree. The only thing they will accomplish in real terms, if they accept this case, is delay, and the delay could be considerable. You know, I'm not a betting man, but I do think the smarter money is riding on the Supreme Court letting this one go, leaving the appellate court opinion intact, returning it to Judge Chutkin, putting it back on the trial track, and, you know, let's get this justice show on the road. George, let's widen the scope a little here. Has a party ever had a worse day in modern history? Just think about today. Republicans' leading candidate got crushed in a serious legal case. Their new speaker went down on two bills in the House, and the head of the RNC could likely be on her way out. And the Senate is blocking its own border bill. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, that's a quadrifecta, I think. And 
And it, it just show, goes to show you the damage that Donald Trump has done to this party. I mean, he's basically now going to be, he's, he's the front runner to be the, the nominee for president. He's under indictment with 91 counts. He doesn't have immunity. He's losing in court. He loses to E. Jean Carroll. He loses to, loses to Jack Smith. He's going to lose some more. And meanwhile, the, the, there is no agenda in the Republican Party. There is no belief in anything. It's all about trying to obstruct uh, positive positive changes, including things that they've asked for in the immigration bill, in order to create issues for a campaign, which which they're not raising much money for, and they don't have really great prospects if, if Donald Trump is continuing to lose and continuing to, to, to be in faces a trial uh, this summer, which I think will absolutely happen in the January 6th case. Glenn, there's another topic I want to ask you about. I know we're going to get into it later in the program. It's Jennifer Crumbly. She was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in her son's school shooting. How big a deal is this verdict legally? You know, on the one hand, it's it's significant because, as you say, you know, a parent hasn't previously been held accountable for a mass shooting perpetrated by a, a, a son or a daughter. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's not that unusual that we hold folks accountable for homicides who don't necessarily pull the trigger. We hold aiders and abettors accountable, even if they didn't pull the trigger. We hold co-conspirators accountable, even if they didn't pull the trigger. I think it's wonderful that they are expanding liability in this way, because maybe it will have some deterrent effect, but it really feels like we continue to refuse to go to the crux of the problem, which is guns and weapons of mass destruction, assault rifles, and expanding liability is helpful, but I don't know that it will end up preventing future mass shootings. All right, Glenn, thank you so much. Katie George, thank you as well. As I said, a busy night. I'm not